uh, with great pleasure, I announce to you Nathan, who will be talking about exploit in theater, and he will do the introduction of himself himself. Give a round of applause to him. I guess I have to check the mic. Mic works. Okay. Is there audio? For the audience? Oh. No? Audio? Das braucht man, um in den Krieg zu ziehen. Nachtsichtgerät, feuerfeste Unterwäsche, Splitterschutzweste, Mut, Gottvertrauen, Sanitätsausrüstung und Ausbildung. Man muss eben wissen, dass es immer gefährlich werden kann. Genevon, ils m'ont ramené aux frontières de Rwanda pour me former être soldat. Früher habe ich Waschmaschinenteile gemacht. Heute machen wir Hightech-Waffenteile. Und die Arbeit war eigentlich genau das Gleiche. Du you know that somewhere over the fence there is someone that actually wants to kill you. Anfangs von den 80er Jahren, beim ersten Golfkrieg, da haben sie gezeigt, wie Teheran verteidigt worden ist. Auf einem Hoteldach oben habe ich gesehen, dass da ein Geschütz steht. Und es war eines von unseren Geschützen, wo wir seinerzeit im Schaden geliefert haben. Wir sind jetzt so bei dem Tarjokosostala. Walk over to him and say hello. Ujambo, abarizako, sasa ni ambie. Kif ana wassalat lahum, an jamia an hahmus, tuajahu, an nas, la sahat, la saha, la yamla mitl, hai al muzahara, wa man nakan, bit tagheer. Ana wadini. Des coups, il y a des coups de balles et des professeurs paniqués. Par terre, par terre Tout d'un coup, il y avait des métiers pour rentrer. Ils ont commencé à tabasser des professeurs, torturer des professeurs à mort. Donc moi, j'ai cherché à fuir là. Ils m'ont récupéré, ils m'ont dit, non, maintenant, maintenant, c'est pas vos papas qui ont soldat, maintenant, c'est vous. means observing systems, figuring out their structure and using them for an alternate purpose. This observation also extends to humans, themselves a system. Take for example this worker here at his locker. He's just putting on his working clothes before entering the lab. It's up to me as a hacker to find the point of entry to influence his routine. Hackers are categorized by the color of their hat. Black hat hackers are those that hack for some malicious reason, and white hat are those that do it to improve security overall. To me, such distinctions are meaningless, and what matters is the natural curiosity of systems or environments. I want you to use this switch, and I want you to switch it off and on again. Three, two, one. What happened? What effect did it have? So where are we? Let's suppose we've entered the Iranian nuclear lab. Viruses or weapons can be installed using bugs in Windows software or something as simple as a USB stick passed between individuals, like this Russian lab engineer working in the Iranian nuclear enrichment facility. He'll find oh. <laughs> through your observation, he will use it. Do you think he trusts his environment, the tools he works with, his computer? 
The nature of cyber weapons like Stuxnet is that once they are used, and from the moment they are used, they lose their usefulness over time. Once the weapon is discovered, it's easy to patch the operating system or software to be immune from future attack. Look at the mirror. What would a world be like in which all weapons would expire like Stuxnet? What would a world be like where a tank after two months would be useless? But also in this world, you don't know when a simple tool you develop might get transformed into a weapon by somebody else and you have no say over where it gets used or against whom. For example, Dean, this friend of mine, developed a tool six years ago called Metasploit that is used to test security of systems. It is common for developers of such tools to release them open source, and this is what he did. Dean doesn't even work in the field of security anymore, and he went off to become a designer. But last year, emails were found between engineers at the Iranian enrichment plant claiming that his tool was being used to attack them. Apparently, Metasploit was used to gain access to the systems, and the scientists reported that computers would start playing a song by ACDC at max volume in the middle of the night. The song was Thunderstruck. Perhaps we should come to a point of completing this operation, of me hacking you. Now do exactly as I say. Take a right and go back through the hall, and go back to the chair and put the hat back on the chair exactly as you found it. So uh, this was uh, a clip from Situation Rooms. Um, this is a piece by Rimini Protocol that deals with the arms trade. Um, it involves a cast, an astonishing cast, of about 20 people whose lives are affected by the arms trade. I think my role as a, a hacker was perhaps the least uh, significant. Uh, it includes people who were shot in protests in Syria, um, people who designed weapons in an arms manufacturer. I think there was an executive from an arms manufacturer, a member from the German parliament. Uh, the list is, is quite astonishing. Uh, and I did play the role of a hacker, and that is what I am. I reverse engineer hardware and software, but that is not what I'm here to talk about today. Instead, I'm going to talk about my work in theater and uh, try to give you a sense of the questions uh, that come up and that uh, the motivations behind uh, my involvement. In 1997, uh, Eric Raymond wrote a little parable called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Um, in this uh, parable, he uh, distinguishes um, software development models into two categories. There is the centralized model where code is submitted to a central repository for arbitration, the cathedral. And there is the decentralized model where arbitration comes through the act of consumption, the bazaar. And uh, he meant this as a sort of a uh, to argue for the efficiency of uh, the model of the bazaar, uh, but we can see now that this model has a much greater impact on our society than just technology and code alone. Um, if you were to, for example, uh, look at its application in other hierarchies in society, um, you might see that uh, journalism and uh, finance are, are good places where we're seeing the impact of the bazaar model. Um, Sorry. Um, and uh, this, this is kind of uh, what drive, drives me to, to, to look at what the impact of this is on our uh, behavior. Uh, in particular, my fix is kind of, I'm kind of fixated on uh, the uh, consumption as arbitration uh, element. Uh, for example, if we apply this model to democracy, uh, does the, what does that do to a vote when the vote uh, is not a vote, but just a meet your, your consumption of an idea. Um, and I think that some of the works uh, do touch on this or rub up against it in, in some way, but I would like to present a, a sort of warning in how to uh, perceive this talk. Oh, I appear to have double slides. In 1844, the first year of the commercial telegraph, uh, Kierkegaard published a book called The Concept of Thread. 
He was quite aware that a new environment had formed around the old mechanical one. And whenever a new environment goes around an old one, there's always new terror. In, we live in a time when we have put a man-made satellite environment around the planet. The planet is no longer nature. It's no longer the external world. It's now the content of an artwork. Uh, this is a clip that was shown in a piece I'm going to show uh, called Anonymous P, and I show it to, to say to you if, or if over the next hour you feel like I'm pushing terror. That's not my intent. Uh, my interest really is uh, human behavior, and I feel that uh, technology and its intersection with it gives us an opportunity to, from which to look at uh, human behavior. Uh, and theater is not a space uh, for literal discussion and debate. Um, it's a space for experience, and it's quite possible that when you take questions that we have and put them into poetic form, that they could come out feeling like fear. But that's not my intent. Uh, the first uh, collaboration I would like uh, to discuss is uh, Herman's Battle with Remini Protocol. Geht los? Ja. So. Okay. Ich bin Remzia Sulic, Muslima aus Srebrenica. Wer bist du? Also, ich bin kein Deutscher, ich bin Peter Glaser, ich bin online und deshalb spielt es eigentlich keine Rolle, wo ich bin und wer ich bin. Und trotzdem ist es erheblich. Ich weiß, ich bin jetzt auch in einem Theater. So that's the opening. Uh, this was uh, a piece um, by Rimini Protocol. They make documentary theater instead of actors. They have uh, what are called experts, which are people uh, discussing things from their life and experiences. In this case, uh, the cast was Barbara uh, talking about the Arab Spring and her sort of uh, perception of it through social media as an Egyptian. Uh, there was Ramzia who uh, survived uh, a massacre, genocide in, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, there was, uh, I think I actually now, s there was a, a retired colonel um, who uh, in NATO, who was uh, active in NATO around the same time as that conflict. There was myself uh, discussing growing up as a non-Jew in the Israeli territories during the Second Intifada. And there was uh, Peter Glazer, who is a CCC veteran, who many here probably know, uh, talking about his history in hacking and uh, sort of his philosophy uh, that he could bring to this discussion. I'm sorry, I have to switch my slides. Can you guys just realized? Okay, where are we? Here. There we go. Okay. Zurück in Berlin kapiere ich dann, wie das Ganze funktioniert. Am 18.01.2011 stellt die ägyptische Bloggerin Asma Mahfouz ihren ersten Videolog ja. und Aufruf zur Revolution ins Netz. Diese Bloggerin ist ein unheimliches Risiko eingegangen, denn sie wusste genau, wenn am 25.01. niemand auf den Tahrirplatz kommt, dann wird sie von der Polizei eingesperrt und vielleicht sogar getötet werden. Und dass es eine Frau sich traut, ist nochmal bedeutsamer in diesem Land. Dieser Mut, ihre Stimme, ihre Dringlichkeit, das alles hat mich so berührt, dass ich genau wusste, wenn ich Ende Januar nach Kairo fliege, dann muss ich auch auf den Tahrirplatz gehen, um für ein besseres und freieres Ägypten zu demonstrieren. Ihr Video wurde ca. 200.000 Mal aufgerufen und ihm sind ca. 15.000 Menschen gefolgt. 
25.01. Ich. Was machst du gerade? This is incredible. God, I wish I was there already. Three more days. Three more days to go. Teilen. Darauf antwortet eine Freundin, Schätzchen, ich kann mir vorstellen, wie es in dir brodeln muss. Aber bitte, stürz dich nicht einfach in die Menge. Du bist noch gebraucht. Darauf ich. Was machst du gerade? These protests throughout Cairo happened even though they were strictly forbidden for today. Today is police day in Cairo. Cairo. People are chanting things like Egypt is too, too much, much for you, for Oga, man. Oga man. And our, our people, people are awake, are awake and, will and will not sleep. sleep. Thailand. This is the attack of the On the 26th of January, the Egyptian regime shuts Twitter off. Ich bin immer noch in Berlin und poste Videos, die zeigen, wie Demonstranten einfach riesige Mubarak-Plakate von den Wänden runterreißen. Ich? Was machst du gerade? This is unbelievable. My God. I just can't wait to get there. Two more days. Two more days. Teile dich. Das war die Zeit, in der bin ich aufgestanden, habe schnell irgendwas gefrühstückt, geduscht und bin dann sofort ins Facebook gegangen. Ich? Was machst du gerade? At Tahrir Square, clashes become more violent as well. Police are arresting people left and right, especially, especially journalists. journalists, and more tear gas. Twitter, Twitter is, still down. is still down. Holy shit. Thailand. Dann bin ich arbeiten gegangen. Am Abend texte ich. Ich? Was machst du gerade? First Twitter, now Facebook. Egypt, Egypt is like Syria, is like and, Syria Iran. and Iran. What the, What the fuck? fuck? Thailand. Darunter stelle ich ein Video, das Ausschreitungen zwischen der ägyptischen Polizei und den Demonstranten zeigt. Ich? Was machst du gerade? Once again, holy shit. Teilen. Die Demonstranten hatten unheimlich von den Posts gelernt, die die Tunesier zuvor ins Netz gestellt hatten. Zum Beispiel, wenn es um den Umgang mit Tränengas ging. If you don't have any vinegar soaked or water soaked bandanas with you or you're around someone who doesn't, Carry with you an onion. If gassed, break it in half and put it close to your eyes and nasal cavity. It greatly reduces the irritation. I learned this from a photojournalist in Gaza. Das wurde dann von den Ägyptern später weiter, weiter an die Libyer zugespielt. Anruf bei meinem Cousin. Er sagt mir, ich weiß zwar nicht, wie gefährlich das jetzt alles wird, aber komm unbedingt. On the 27th of January, the communication networks are interrupted. Facebook, Twitter und YouTube funktionieren nicht mehr richtig. E-Mails und Nachrichtenseiten funktionieren noch. On the 28th of January, the regime brings about a complete halt of the Internet. Es ist ein Kill Switch. Die erste Totalabschaltung eines nationalen Internetbereichs in der Geschichte des Netzes überhaupt. At least nine Middle Eastern and North African state censors use Western built technologies to impede access to online content. The list of sites blocked are maintained by these same Western companies. For example, McAfee Smart Filtry maintains an online database with over 25 million websites that can be blocked in over 90 categories, including anonymizing technology, government and military information, hacking information, history. Bei dem Kill Switch in Ägypten äh, gab es übrigens auch Ausnahmen. Die Börse ist mysteriöserweise online geblieben. Eine Frage an meiner Wand. Und? Wie hast du dich entschieden? Ich? Was machst du gerade? Ich werde fliegen. Teilen. Sicherheitsabfrage. Wollen Sie dieser Verbindung vertrauen? Wollen Sie dennoch verbunden werden? Achter Auftritt. Hermann, indem er Schwert und Schild weglegt. Communication on the Internet is all about trust. If I want to communicate with Barbara, for example, with absolute secrecy, I have no way of knowing if her Internet provider or mine or her government or mine are not watching our wires and monitoring our communication. So to communicate with her securely, I use encryption. First, I have to obtain her key. This, for example, is my key. 
Once I have her key, I can encrypt a message by putting it in uh, this box. And now only she is able to see the contents of this box. Now I can send it to her, and neither her government nor mine, nor her ISP nor mine, can see the contents of that message. However, they can still see that it was Barbara and I who were communicating with each other, and this also carries a risk. So to protect against this, I use an anonymous network called Tor, the onion router. Tor is basically like a series of encrypted boxes. Everyone that's participating on the network has a box that they can share with someone else to use. With these boxes, only the person that gave me the box is able to see whatever is put inside. So using them, I can create a sort of secure routing protocol on top of the internet. I take my message and put it in a series of boxes, creating various layers, much like an onion. And then I send this package to the kernel back over the internet. When he gets it, he sees a box for him that he can open, but inside he finds another box addressed to Rummelsdorf, who at the moment is injured and not able to go upstairs. So Rummelsdorf would normally open his box and see a box for Ramzia, who would eventually open the box and see a box addressed to Barbara. In this way, for example, the kernel is unable to tell where the message is going. He can only see that he got something from me, but he has no idea that it was meant for Barbara. And Ramzia can only see that she sent something to Barbara, but she has no idea what it was and where it came from. So in this way, I can, can communicate with Barbara, both securely and anonymously, without governments being able to correlate the who, what, or why of our communication. This service is used by dissidents in Iran and Syria to communicate freely online about crimes against humanity or corruption. And for this reason, its development is sponsored in part by the US government. But it can also be used by such organizations as WikiLeaks to protect whistleblowers and expose corruption in the West. And for this reason, some of its developers are this very moment being prosecuted by the US government. Uh, so we also uh, dealt, this, this piece, by the way, was around 2010. We also dealt with the issue of Bitcoin and uh, assassination markets. But uh, this actually, this part uh, inspired a, a piece which we worked on recently. So I will, I will detail that. <clears throat> uh, Write a Mite is a, a, a piece we just recently performed in Gießen for the Discourse Festival, or we tested it there, I should say. We, we used a lecture performance format uh, to test it. The name is taken from uh, uh, the papers exchanged between Freud and Einstein in 1932, where they kind of discussed this concept of right of might, uh, which were also quoted in Jim Bell's assassination politics paper, which he sent to the uh, cypherpunk mailing list uh, in the 90s. Uh, in this uh, piece, I play a neoliberal character. I play a character uh, who is sort of this libertarian decentralization will solve all our world, world's problems, which I actually think is quite pervasive uh, and whom I disagree with in many ways and question. Um, what you see uh, here is the opening uh, where I uh, create paper Bitcoin wallets and put one euro worth on each wallet. Um, and then I hand them out uh, to the audience. Uh, this character ha has this ideology that he wants to profess, which is that the problems of the world, specifically ecological problems, have to do with economic models that require constant growth, uh, for which inflation is part of that. But he gets a little twisted and he blames this problem on the inability for us to not compete, and in particular, a psychological bias of males on competition. So he blames it on males. And then he looks at Bitcoin as being uh, asexual. This is theater, by the way, uh, as asexual and as a solution to this. Um, and I cannot quite show you all of the, the elements, but I'll give you a small taste.
inflation, the increase in prices and decrease in the purchasing value of money. So this is 10 kilograms of rice, which I purchased yesterday in Gießen for the price of 25 euro. With it slowly falling to the ground, it is gradually losing its value to me, much in the same way that the euro loses its value over time. The guiding principle of the European Central Bank is that the inflation of the euro should hold around 2% per year. That means that the same 25 euro that today will buy you 10 kilograms of rice, tomorrow, uh, sorry, by 2020, it would purchase you around eight, and by 2030, less than six. This devaluing of money is inevitable, we know this, but why is it necessary? If the European Central Bank didn't make certain that our money slowly loses its value over time, we would hold on to it too much. Inflation creates a sort of pressure, forcing us to constantly move our money and put it into things of actual value. But why can't we instead just keep the money that we've earned? What's, what's wrong with this? Paradoxically, our society can only re retain its stability when our economy is growing. The main principle of our economic system is growth. I think that the issue of this constant cycle of growth and competition has to do with male dominance and a neurological dependence of males on competition as an indicator for self-worth. There was this interesting study uh, in Finland called Gender Differences in Emotional Responses to Cooperative and Competitive Gameplay. Now previous research in the field of psychology has already shown definitively that men prefer competition. But what this study wanted to examine was, or, was whether men have a higher emotional response to competition than women do. And the way in which they measured this was by looking at the heart rate and facial muscle activity as an indicator of emotional response. And indeed, the results show that men have a higher emotional response uh, toward, toward, during competitive rather than cooperative gameplay. This man has a neurological dependence on competition. <laughs> But more interestingly, what this study also shows is that women have no psychological uh, hindrance or a psychological preference towards competition. In fact, it shows that they treat both competition and cooperation with the same level of importance. So this woman has no bias. Um. Yes, so uh, we, we get to the moment where we sort of, I don't know if I, I, yes, I have another one, sorry. I hope. Do I, do I, this one. Using Bitcoin exclusively would take away the tool that those in power have to force economic growth, the central bank. The central bank is the group that determines when to print money and when not and ultimately determines what the value of your wealth is or will be in the future. And this control over a, a currency is power, political power, which is why in, Margaret Thatcher argued so strongly against the creation of a unified European currency in Parliament in 1990. I'm most grateful to the Prime Minister would you tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight against a single currency and an independent central bank when she leaves office? No, she's going to be the governor. On the present structure...
Prime Minister. What a good idea. <laughs> There'd be no European Central Bank accountable to no one, least of all to national parliaments. Yeah, yeah, because the point of that kind of European Central Bank is no democracy, taking powers away from every single parliament and being able to have a single currency and a monetary policy and an interest rate which takes all political powers away from us. What she said is that a European Central Bank would be a subversion of democracy, that this would take power away from the people. But I think we should go further. And I think that using virtual currencies takes power not only away from national central banks, but takes power away from all central banks. So with uh, the audience primed, uh, with their interest in having uh, this Bitcoin in the pocket, uh, their pocket, uh, this paper wallet, we come to the end scene, uh, which is here. This is Assassination Market, a crowdfunding website that lets users anonymously donate Bitcoin in order to have political leaders murdered. And some of the bounties have already reached tens of thousands of dollars. The author of this concept, Assassination Market, was an electrical engineer at Intel named Jim Bell. After publishing his paper, he spent nearly 10 years in a US prison. In his paper, he quoted Freud's concept of the right of might. In one corner of the dark web sits an interesting con uh, rendition of this assassination market concept. In this market, in this market, the winnings go to the assassin that kills the target that currently has the highest price on their head. So what you see happening right now is that users that support Julian Assange, that means users that want to see him continue living, are earnestly trying to get people to put bitcoins into the pool for Assad. Because if they don't do that, if they don't get Assad's price up, then any would-be assassin out there would be more inclined to kill Assange rather than Assad. Now, you hold in your hand one bitcoin. It's yours. And I want you to use it however you choose. But until you import it to your phone or your computer or use it, I still have access to them because I have copies. And if you don't do this and use it within two weeks, then a bet will be randomly placed for you in this assassination market. And with that, I open the floor to questions. So, oops. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I would like to clarify first that uh, that assassination race website and the Assad versus Assad uh, competition and race uh, exists only on local host. It was created just for this theater piece and it's not real. Um, <clears throat> but the audience doesn't know that initially um, and so it would have this kind of impact. And uh, this is kind of what I meant perhaps for some, maybe this is like, a moment of terror to some degree, as Marshall McLuhan would say, where the algorithmic world wraps around the physical. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't mean for it to be that way. I mean, the, the era in which Freud and Einstein discussed the concept of right of might, meaning um, the power of a collective over the violence of individuals, uh, that's basically the summarization of the concept. Uh, it was an era of unionization, unions, and uh, an increasing importance of the collective. And, uh, but what happens, I wonder, and with this example, I wonder what happens when we live in a world where we have only the collective. Oops, wrong. <laughs> it seems that we're always trying to progress in the direction that power is distributed more to the people's hands or that we give the people the more potential to participate. 
technology will make this happen. But if you go to the absolute limit of this idea, that is absolute democracy, it's not something I'm sure that I want. That's the, uh, the closing scene from Herman's Battle from 2010, just after we kind of introduced the concept of, uh, of this type of market uh, there. And uh, to me, assassination markets sit at an extreme end of the scale of things uh, that utilize collective consensus. Uh, it's, it's an end which I hope we never get to, and I hope we never have to depend on them. Um, but it brings me back to this uh, broader question of uh, what happens uh, when you reduce the weight of a stakeholder to that of a consumer. Um, we have one scene, oops, we have one scene in uh, Herman's Battle where Barbara is looking at a website called avaz.org, uh, which is a, a site which tries to utilize the potential of the like button for political action. And uh, they, are, they, they are effective in the in some of the, the issues that they do tackle, but I was trying to look in, in the reverse direction at the people constantly hitting like, and uh, there's this scene with Barbara sort of reading them off. This person likes that, you know, free Snowden, whatever. This person likes all, that was before, way before Snowden. Uh, and so to me, what's, what's interesting is what happens when uh, the like button becomes our voice. Uh, that's what I find interesting. Or to put it another way, uh, what happens when how or how does the pervasiveness of the things on the left affect ca uh, things in the category on the right or how we perceive it? Um, so that's the question. Sorry, this is the next project. Last night, I had a terrible dream. I dreamed that I was being chased by a giant. Und im Dunkel böse Mächte walten, ist ein fundamentales, tragisches Missverständnis. And it's going to get worse with the next generation and the next generation who extend the capabilities of this sort of architecture of oppression. Uh, you realize that you might be willing to accept any risk. And the beauty of the punishment was this. You know, like, be himself there forever. As an example, and trust me, there's an off button. Learn how to use it. Das heißt, dass der Herr Randolph 
der mit in der Spiel ist, der Herr Völke. 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 No, not Völke. At assistance.ch. Anyway, um, in case, maybe you can come to us afterwards, but come with us. Uh, she, she's going to get out now. Yeah, go with him. Come to Rudolf. Rudolf. Rudolf, sorry. Rudolf. Uh, so, uh, she's going to get help right now. Um, you might think that this is a special circumstance, that this is a special network, but it's not. Everything we have here is what exists in an internet cafe. Anyone sitting close to you in an internet cafe could also get your passwords. And maybe a lot of you decided not to use your phone because you were worried this would happen. And that's a real pity, especially for, especially for Rudolf, because he won't know in the end, but at least uh, she, she, she will know when she comes out and she's safe. I don't know about the rest of you. So this uh, is uh, a small segment, sorry for the audio, from uh, the show Anonymous P. Um, this is a piece by Chris and Christiana. Uh, they would have loved to have been here presenting, but they're uh, away on another project at the moment. Uh, what you see here, this scene, is uh, users coming into the theater and registering for a random persona that's assigned to them. Uh, the actual only reason for it is so that we can secretly take a picture, picture of them when they register. Um, uh, they're, registering, uh, they're registering to play a data trading game, which plays an important role uh, in the show. The show is uh, a show between you, your device, the actors and the hackers in the space, and uh, we use a lot of different methods to turn your device into a tool of discrimination against you. Um, so uh, it's uh, kind of an installation. Uh, so you see the space here. Um, uh, it's an installation. Uh, it's a large uh, group of people that worked on all the code, and, and uh, some of them are here, uh, in, at least at the at the Congress, or are here in the space today. And uh, the, one of the first things that happens to you uh, when you come into the, the, the when you register is you have to play a, a game. Some people may recognize this. It's a it's it's the history hack, where any website, if they can convince you to interact with it in some uh, determinate manner, can sort of uh, get you to reveal the history, your browser history, uh, by so you're. You're revealing your browser history when you click on the red squares in this case, and each red square is a link to a website, but you don't go to it, but you tell us you have it. Uh, normally, uh, in the real example, that would then you would then get a, a view of your psychological profile based on the categorization, but we don't show you that in the game. Uh, we just add this data, your browser history, to a whole pool of data that we use dramatically in other scenes. Um, during uh, the, the, the entrance, you may notice some people, there's a packet monitor uh, here. Uh, there's a scene at the beginning where uh, Christiana uh, reads out packets in a very literal manner. Um, it has this effect of sort of giving you this ghost or, or remembering this ghost uh, kind of, of the technology that it seems so opaque and we don't understand. And this comes back every once in a while. And we wanted our actors, or they needed to be able to easily read this, and no network monitor we really found would make it easy. So we wrote one, uh, which you can find at this link. It's uh, released under the non-white heterosexual male software license. Uh, and have fun. Uh, when you come into the space, uh, you scan someone, uh, and then you are asked a question, or you get three random questions. Questions such as, does this person have a tendency to cheat on their partner? Uh, and you see there is a monetary value placed on each question. Uh, together, this uh, sort of is the value of all of the data, uh, should we sell it after the show. Um, and while you're running around scanning people and having fun, um, we, the, the hackers and the actors, are monitoring profiles, looking at them. There you see the picture we secretly took, uh, trying to find, we're looking for data in the profiles that we can use on these people in these scenes. So uh, here you can see, uh, we know uh, that Buddy has an Apple device, and for most Apple devices, the network name reveals their real name. Um, I won't go over it all. We have. Uh, we can sometimes tell who you came to the show with just based on your behavior. We can uh, see the total value that you've given us uh, with all the data that you've compiled on other people or that has been compiled on you. Here we would see your browser history and then an overview of the, uh, of the questions. I wonder if I can just skip forward. Um, 
which is what the audience sort of determined from you. We can also uh, see uh, your movement in the space, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, pieces of data. And it gets used in, in various ways, such as this scene from Phil. Strange feeling uh, about somebody, somebody here tonight. Uh, yeah, did this person, um, we know him as Jimmy, but Jimmy, I have a feeling your real name is, is Stefan. And there's somebody very keen to contact you who is not here this evening. And they know that you're worried because we know that you visit the info lab and so you're worried about that. Maybe it's money because we think you might be a Julius Bear customer and that might be playing in your mind. I just want to let you know, Stefan, that there's somebody not here tonight who cares about you, who's trying to send you a personal message to, to help you. It's just a feeling. Um, Getting, uh, well, I'm getting another image. I'm getting an image of uh, an old lady standing in a kitchen. Uh, now that's my grandma. Uh, it's not useful. Um, the the Lerlin, uh, I know you're called the Lerlin, but I think you're still a student. And and I know that your name is Jonas. And Jonas, you know somebody who who lives in another country. And Jonas. This person is trying to send you a photographic image of a very personal nature. And I think you should look at that this evening, but look at it alone. Just the, the feeling of it. Or the data may be used when you go to the bar to order a drink. Uh, here we see Venus has tried to order a beer. And uh, because she makes over 5,000 Swiss francs, or the audience determined that, and because she has an Apple device, she's charged two euro extra. Um, so... Uh, before the, the show, actually, we get a list of names, uh, in some cases, of people that are coming to the show, and we do research, and we find ways uh, to... Uh, get information on them. Uh, we, for instance, get pictures of them or their friends and use them in a couple scenes. And here is one scene. Sorry, it's in German. Don't have subtitles. Es ist der Abstand zwischen dem linken Auge und dem rechten Auge im Verhältnis zur Nase in Relation zum Mund. Das reicht ein Ihr Gesicht zu erkennen, das heißt Facebook, um zu sagen, hey, dein Onkel Chris, deine Tante Agatha, deine Freundin, und sagen. For, the, for the, those who don't understand, Jimmy, she's talking about Facebook's facial recognition algorithms. Deep Face ist Facebooks neue Gesichtserkennungssoftware, die mit 120 Millionen Parameter arbeitet. 120 Millionen Wellen in deinem Gesicht. Die roten Rechte werden auf ein 3D-Modell, sodass dein Kopf Die 
So uh, it's, it's quite effective, I think, to see a picture of yours uh, sort of ripped through with nails and have a discussion about Facebook's uh, facial recognition algorithms at the same time. Uh, here's another scene. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers initially welcoming IBM with open arms now fear an IBM-dominated and controlled future. They are increasingly and desperately turning back to Apple as the only force that can ensure their future freedom. on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? You know what, folks? Last night, I had a terrible dream. I had this really bad dream. I was I was on, on, on the what is it, on the seal there, and I was running, and this thing was chasing me. And basically, what it was is I was being chased by a giant search engine. There was a giant search engine in the sky, following me and swooping down at me, and swooping back up. And then I would run a little bit more, it would swoop down at me and swoop back up. It was one of those dreams that go on forever and ever. You don't get anywhere, right? But the, but the search engine kept coming, bang, bang. And I kept saying, why? Why is this happening? And then in the dream, I realized, ah, maybe somebody is trying to Google me, right? Which maybe turned out to be the case. I don't know, because basically at that point, the search engine came to me and said, Chris, chill out. Cool off. We don't want to hurt you. We're, we're just trying to, to, to fill up our profile of you. And then, and then I realized the search engine wasn't chasing me, but it was picking up all those little bits of, of data that I leave behind in a day. You know, the tweets and the SMSs and, and the cell phone logs and the GPS traces. This flying thing was coming and picking up all those things. Right? And uh, I have to say that this disturbed me. Right? So what I did was, I immediately went over to the Tagus Anzeiger. Oh, sorry, Chris. Chris, I'm confused. Uh, are we still in the dream? No. I woke up. I woke up in, in, in a cold sweat. Right. I went to the Tagus Anzeiger. And you went to the building to talk to the journalists? Oh, oh, oh. I went to the website. Oh, all right. Okay. Just I put my name. I went to the website. I put my name in, hit return to see if somebody had written something about me, if there was some had, they, had anybody written about you? I mean, was anybody interested? No. Kein Treffer. No. My name didn't bring up anything. Oh, Chris. Yes, what you do Next time you do a search like that, if you put my name in first, you might get, like, more hits. It's just a suggestion. There was no, nobody interested in you? Well... That's actually the point of, of this story that I wanted to tell is because when I went to the Tagus Anzeiger, I realized that I was being followed by a lot of uh, website trackers like DoubleClick, like AdSense. There was also Google Analytics was there. In fact, whenever you go anywhere on a website, there are a thousand little websites following you around. A thousand little, you know, you've heard about the cookies and the crumbs and everything. They were all there following me. And in fact, everything I clicked on was being recorded. And then AdSense would take it and sell it to Blue Kai, who would auction it off to Audience Science, who would create an advertisement just for me. In fact, there was a whole economy being based just on following me around. Yeah, but Chris, some people don't like being followed, do they? Chris. Yes. Do you know what time it is? No. It's time for pre-crime. Um, 
The show is, uh, was very research driven. Uh, Chris and Christiana put a lot of research in it. And one of the topics that came up was, uh, forgiveness in a world that doesn't forget. Uh, to say that differently, um, what is the importance of being able to forget to forgive ourselves? And uh, this kind of inspired a, an installation for theaters uh, that let us do this. Uh, we sort of hijacked their website a week before, and uh, every user has presented this at least once or twice, uh, this sequence, uh, which starts to uh, open links into your browser uh, to subversive sites, to different sexual orientation sites, uh, queries, uh, different languages. Um, it's very real. It does this in a very real way. Uh, and it actually does so uh, half the time using uh, the Google I Feel Lucky feature. So any state agency that might be monitoring your, your nation's networks will now see you're interested in Al-Qaeda. But also, uh, it will be in your Google profile, so you'll get different advertisements, which is a good thing. Uh, um, so, uh, this, this show, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the conclusion, kind of the inspiration was that, uh, forgiveness in a world that doesn't forget is noise, and, uh, so kind of forgiveness is entropy, and it kind of gives you this whole mantra, mantra throughout the whole thing, uh, kind of this propaganda. Um, right, so, uh, so that's, that's the show, but let me bring this back to where I started, and I'm almost finished. Um, with the examination of what effect uh, collective consensus in the bazaar has on our behavior. Um, in one of the shows that we had, we had a person whose password was leaking, and we pulled this person out and we put them in the hut, and I asked her, uh, did you know this was going to happen? She's like, I don't care. And I was like, but we can read all of your emails uh, and see all of your Instagram. And uh, she's like, I don't care. And uh, this character, perhaps, uh, for many of us, is someone that we feel we need to educate on the importance of privacy and civil liberties, uh, but it's also, I think, actually much more common and becoming more common, uh, this type of mentality, because uh, our identity, or the way we perceive uh, self, is changing. Uh, we're slowly changing from uh, identity as self uh, into a society with network being a very central role, uh, a, part, a part of identity. Um, so, uh, in, uh, to, to illustrate it better, um, a month ago or two at the Academy of A Sociality, uh, a philosopher, uh, Alice Legay, gave a talk about um, the works of uh, Derrida and, and George Simmel in relation to the importance of uh, secrecy in relation to, in relationship to our identity. And uh, she summarized their work with this nice uh, saying, which is, you are an individual only to the extent that you are not transparent. Uh, and this sounds very nice. Uh, we are not just fighting for privacy or civil liberties, we're fighting for uh, the meaning of identity uh, or individuality. Um, and that's, that's true, um, but there's still, uh, there's still a change that's definitely happening uh, to self and how we perceive it. And this is kind of why I argue that um, we should be talking about post-existentialism, not post-privacy. And uh, to, kind of, uh, to kind of summarize things, I think that the tools really have an impact on this and are important. But I think something we don't really perceive is the importance of the protocols, the ethics in the protocols, and what impact that has on our collective behavior. Uh, and to uh, kind of illustrate this, I will use a song. Hello. One second. Okay, that one, maybe. Oh, I don't know why it's not working. Why aren't you working there? Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, I don't know why it's not working. Uh, we can try another song. <laughs> anyway, I think you get the point. Um, what you're seeing happening here is, is actually a political philosophy. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a political philosophy that's embedded into one of the deepest parts of the protocols that we use every day. Uh, it's GOIP. Um, and, uh, 
It's GYP, and uh, GYP is a, a broad name that describes a part of the internet uh, that, for example, permits YouTube and uh, Gemma to, to, to uh, restrict access to certain content uh, to visitors from Germany. In the rest of the world, it may show up in different forms, uh, but this is how we see it in Germany. Um, and uh, this is possible because every computer online is given an internet address that can be used to determine uh, the nation of origin and any uh, sort of attempt to recode the internet protocols so that this is not possible would come into a huge wall of resistance because there are a lot of business models that are increasingly dependent uh, on it. But uh, this same technology and the same political philosophy in the protocol is also what permits, uh, to some degree, censorship uh, and surveillance. Uh, this is uh, one of the X key score rules which, which Jacob Applebaum uh, released l last year. Here you see uh, the NSA uh, is using the location, uh, you don't see the IP address, but this technology is using the location of IP addresses to determine whether or not you are a citizen that is allowed to not be monitored when you visit the Tor project website. And this depends on uh, this flaw or this political philosophy uh, in the protocol. Uh, but this same feature, I would argue, uh, can actually, I would argue, kills people um, because uh, to fix it, uh, sorry, because to fix it uh, would potentially make it uh, difficult to follow uh, people or track people that are in more desperate regimes. Meaning if we were to fix, if we were to throw Gemma out the door and we don't care about Gemma anymore, uh, we might be able to actually solve some very life-threatening problems for other people in other parts of the world. And I think any engineer should be completely ashamed that it took the NSA scandal for us to potentially be aware of this. And actually, the truth is, we still aren't, uh, because uh, there was a professor from France that sent to the Inter Internet Engineering Task Force, their official appeals board, a sort of request to consider societies and ethics when we build protocols. And uh, the, the EF, uh, sorry, the, the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force was meh, not our problem. And uh, this whole argument about uh, the ethics and the protocols, I think, is, is really important and missing. And uh, I actually ripped this from, a, uh, from someone who wrote about this on the cypherpunk mailing list earlier this year. And this person uh, who wrote an email titled GYP is a threat to democracy ended it with this one saying, which I will also end with, which is those who would trade liberated networks for efficient, ne efficient networks deserve neither. That's it, thank you. Right. We're already a little over time, but since there's nothing uh, immediately afterwards, I will allow a single question from the internet. So, our signal angel, please give us a question. There are, there are no questions from the internet. <laughs> All right. Anyone here? Well, we can do a single question, but otherwise I think we can also let this stand for, for itself. So. Where's your next show? Oh, uh, the, the... The question uh, was, where's the next show? Okay. Uh, situation rooms, you'll have to check their site. They're all over the place uh, with the, the first thing I showed. Herman's Battle is, hasn't been played for a while. Uh, Anonymous P will be in Vienna in March. Uh, what else did I list? In Glasgow in May. Uh, probably in India now we've kind of gotten a confirmation. Uh, there's some discussion about Los Angeles. Uh, there's some discussion about uh, potentially Israel, uh, but we don't really know about that. Uh, my piece, uh, Right of Might, is an ongoing project. Uh, may show somewhere, but I, I can't really say. I feel really ashamed to say this, but follow me on Twitter if you want to know, but I feel horrible asking for that, so uh, don't know. Thanks. Okay, thank you again, Nathan.